um, but hopefully they can get on soon. So I'm just quickly going to share my screen because um, there's a couple of new names here. So I just want to explain a little bit about the World of Future project. Um, so, firstly, thanks everyone for joining us on a Tuesday night. Um, you'll all be pleased to know, I'm sure, that we think this webinar will finish at about 7.30, so you will have enough time to get ready to watch England lose at <laughs> 8. Um, so, the, um, this webinar is being recorded as well, um, so if you don't want your faces uh, to be on camera, that's fine. You can turn your um, turn your cameras off, but um, it will be being shared with the other people in the World of Future project. Uh, so just to let you know that um, the World of Future for Warwickshire project has been running since January 2020 and is finishing in May of 2022. It's a national lottery heritage funded project um, that is uh, giving. 18 to 35 year olds a uh, training program in conservation, ecology, environmentalism, um, and also marketing communications. Obviously COVID's had a bit of an effect on the project and it hasn't necessarily always run as we had initially um, devised it to, but we've been doing almost weekly webinars now since October and are meeting up in person once or twice a month to do some practical surveying and uh, habitat management work. So if you're not a part of the program currently and you are interested in joining, then I'll put my email address in the chat and you can drop me an email and I'll give you some more information about it. Um, right, that is that. So I'm gonna stop sharing. So I'm gonna pass you guys over to Tony from the Butterfly Conservation uh, Trust and he's gonna go through a bit of a bit of information and training on moth and like I said I think we're probably going to be finished at 7 30 so we're probably not going to have a break in this one we're just going to go through um but if you have any questions or anything pop them in the chat or like put your hand up and uh shout them out as we go along or we can do a bit of a Q&A session at the end whatever kind of suits people better cool so over to you Tony hey thanks very much Joanna um I, I, I'm a bit of a technophobe and um, I found when I did this last time that as soon as I start sharing my screen and do the slideshow on PowerPoint, I lose all sight of you all. And um, so, uh, yeah, um, if you're trying to ask a question, I'm quite happy for you to ask questions as we go along if they're like immediate and it would make more sense to get an answer there and then um, feel free. But Joanna, you might need to sort of interject somehow to draw my attention to, <laughs> to what's going on. Um, they sort of disappear off into this little PowerPoint bubble and uh, that's it. Um, right, so I will share my screen. And hopefully this will work. Right. Can everyone see that now? Good. Okay. Um, so I did this initially for University of East Anglia's, um, what do they call themselves, Ecology and Environment Society. Um, and it seems sort of vaguely appropriate for you guys. Uh, um, I know you most of you will have finished at uni now, but um, it's it's still sort of aimed at young people so um there's a little bit in there about sort of careers and stuff like that as well so um anyway um we'll start off with an introduction to to moths and, and what they do um this photograph is taken in the tropics um sadly you're unlikely to see uh, a sheet quite like that uh, if you run a trap in britain but uh, we live in hope. Um, right, why is it not going on to the next slide? <laughs> ah, it 
it's trying it's trying very slowly to go on to the next slide so um what do moths do well if you if you talk to the media this is this is what moths do um they all eat clothes um and uh, i can remember a particularly uh, awful radio interview with someone talking about moths and and they were they were supposed to be talking about the rare migrants that had come in on the southerly winds at the time um and the interviewer asked them the question do all moths eat clothes and uh, and the interviewee sort of lost the plot a bit and got quite angry about this question but it is if you ever talk to the media about moths you will get asked this question no matter what the topic is that you, you think you're going to be talking about um but the answer is no they don't all eat clothes um there are really out of well over two and a half thousand species there are two that are major pests of, of uh, of fabrics and things in people's homes um, and basically they tend to like uh, cloth that is dirty and undisturbed so um, if people are worried about uh, their prize clothes getting eaten it won't happen unless they sort of leave them in the back of a cupboard for months on end and, and never actually use them uh, i think this is a lot of people's image of moths brown dull all look the same um and that's something that's that i think is being overcome now but uh, but certainly is still a perception um if you think that all moths look like that then again um sadly you're in the wrong country um so, right, the, uh, uh, in Britain, we've got 2,558 species. Um, they range from uh, this species on the left in Tucrosita, say, which is about two millimeters wingspan um, through up to, this is death's head hawk moth, which isn't resident in Britain. But is a fairly regular migrant and and does breed um and that's that's its larva um next to it uh it, it used to be found much more commonly um because um one of the primary things they feed on is potatoes and when people hand dug potatoes they used to find the larvae quite a lot when they're doing that um so if you're absolutely desperate to see a death set hawk moth start growing potatoes and uh, and and dig them dig the the resulting crop yourself uh there's another 191 adventive species adventives are things that have arrived in britain through uh, man assisted means so they might come in in foodstuffs or in um plants that the horticultural trade is a major source of, of of moths being brought in and indeed that's the source of the oak processionary which is um a species that is causing a lot of fuss at the moment it um the caterpillars have irritating hairs and some people react quite badly to them um and that appeared in London probably 10-15 years ago um, and the Forestry Commission have spent literally millions of pounds, I think they spend two million pounds a year just on surveying for it um, and then when they find it they serve notices on the landowners to go and spray noxious chemicals all over it uh, which obviously uh, has a uh, a knock-on effect on a range of other species um it's something we've been opposing for a number of years basically because they've lost the battle it's still spreading it's out into well into surrey sussex kent surrounding counties now um it, all, and, and all this money and all these toxic pesticides they're putting out into the environment 
it's just a waste of time. All it's doing is slowly it's slowing the spread slightly. It's a thing we're going to have to get used to. People are going to have to learn that in the same way as you don't touch a stinging nettle, you keep away from um, oak processionary caterpillars. Um, so yeah, uh, that's uh, that was sorry. That was an example of a thing that comes in. If you buy things like peppers, organic peppers from supermarkets, you sometimes get um, uh, caterpillars in there, which can be quite interesting to breed out and see what you get. Um, there's about 58 species that have become extinct. Um, it's difficult to give a precise figure because. Uh, it's hard to make a definition of when something is definitely extinct. There was a species refound in Kent uh, two years ago that hadn't been seen for over 50 years. So sometimes you can think something's extinct and it isn't. Um, but a few that we think that definitely are, um, this is Brighton wainscot. Um, the larvae feed in wild grasses and then when they're still quite small, they leave the grass and bore into the stem of cereal crops. Um, and it's declined massively right across Europe. We think it's partly due to, obviously partly due to pesticides, but partly due to the change from spring grown cereals to autumn grown cereals. It means that the stems of the, of the cereals are more robust um, when the caterpillar wants to bore into them and, and they perhaps struggle also, the varieties that are grown tend to be shorter with, with tougher stems. Um, but yeah, we, it was last seen 2001 on Salisbury Plain, has been looked for by the Twitchers fairly extensively since then, um, and no one's had any luck. So we think that's probably gone. Um, Syncopatma albic palpella um, is a tiny little micro moth that feeds on petty win. Um, it's a, a spiny plant in the pea family, sort of about the size of heather. Um, if you look at a distribution map for petty win, it's still sort of fairly widespread. But when you actually start going to sites and looking, you find it's often just one plant or half a dozen plants. It's really not enough to support a population. Um, so we're pretty sure that's died out. We've been to all the uh, all the former sites and it's not there anymore. Um, and this is Scythra sicella, which um, the larvae feed in a little silken tube um, and they come out from the tube and, and munch on the leaves and then go back into the tube to, to hide. It was last known from uh, Chessel Beach in Dorset um, and we think a combination of factors have done for it there, one of which was a pollution incident where raw sewage went all over its habitat. Um, but generally the habitat seemed to be becoming much grassier um, and probably with a colder, wetter microclimate in there. So it's just slowly died out, unfortunately. However, on the plus side, there's over 130 new species been recorded in Britain just since the year 2000. Um, some of these are sort of primary migrants, like this ring border, um, which have flown across the channel. Um, some are adventives imports. This is Musatima nitidalis, um, which feeds on a variety of ferns, including bracken. Um, and it's a resident of New Zealand. So we don't think that one flew here of its own accord. Um, almost certainly came in with the horticultural trade, um, has become abundant in a number of areas. It seems to have been imported on several different occasions. It was first found on the Dorset Hampshire border, uh, then quite quickly was found in the Ashdown Forest area in East Sussex. And I think there's now, um, a colony north of London. So yeah, it seems to be several different imports, um, but pretty little thing. And you know, if it eats bracken, it's not doing anyone any harm. So um, I, I quite welcome that one. Um, 
some are taxonomic changes so uh, this species uh, is basically a new species because it, the what was thought to be one species is now two um, so that can make life quite tricky especially if they're really difficult to tell apart um, I think when it comes to sort of having to do uh, DNA analysis to identify a species, I, I rapidly lose interest. Um, this this species can actually be told apart from its its sibling, um, but it's it's not easy, um, and so hence have been overlooked for uh, all the time before. Um, and some are probably overlooked residents. So this Ectodemia heckfordii um, was found by Bob Heckford, uh, feeds on oak trees. It's named from just one site in Devon uh, and it's a tiny little thing. Um, yeah, probably been here all along and just nobody, uh, nobody knew about it. That wasn't just new to Britain, that was new to science, hence uh, named after Bob. Um, so out of uh, these two and a half thousand species, there's about 950 are classed as macro moths and 1600 as micro moths. Um, taxonomically, it's a completely meaningless separation. It originated from the Victorians when they first started producing books about moths and they basically produced books on, on the big ones and ignored the little ones. Um, and so, I mean, taxonomically, you, you sort of have some macros, then some micros, then some macros, then a load of micros, uh, then butterflies, then a load more micros, and then the rest of the macros. So uh, we take great delight in the moth team in taking the mickey out of our butterfly colleagues and telling them that butterflies are just an obscure group of micro moths now. Um, but this distinction has stuck. Um, and so you will find that the books will deal with either macros or micros generally. Um, these are two popular field guides that most people use. The micros one isn't comprehensive. It doesn't cover all 1600 species. Um, you need to get into quite expensive literature, usually a series of books. Uh, if you want to do all micros, but that book will get you started and cover all the sort of uh, ones that are readily identifiable in the field. So what's the ecological importance of moths? Well, they're an important food source for a lot of things, obviously birds, um, the cuckoos famously are able to eat the hairy caterpillars. Um, and we have looked with RSPB at whether there might be a link between the decline of cuckoos and decline of those species that produce the hairy caterpillars. But um, they've done DNA and analysis of the cuckoo poo and basically find that they will eat pretty much any caterpillar. Um, they sort of have gained this reputation for eating the hairy ones because they're one of the few species that can but they will eat anything else they come across as well so um we don't think that there's a a link specifically between the decline of cuckoos and these particular species obviously some bats eat an awful lot of moths um can be quite irritating when you're running your trap and you can see dozens of bats dive bombing over the top and snaffling everything before they go in your trap. Um, but uh, that's that's life for a moth trapper. But there's a range of other things that will eat moths as well. So here we've got some shield bugs that are, um, they have stuck their proboscis into this caterpillar and are sucking the juices out. Parasitic wasps, um, Oh, sorry, that's not a parasitic wasp. Uh, um, so this is a, a sand wasp, a mothler, that um, will actually catch a caterpillar, sting it to paralyze it, and then it takes it back to its nest, 
uh, puts it in in its in the nest burrow and lays its eggs on it, and then the caterpillars emerge or the larvae of the wasp emerge and then feed on the on the caterpillars that are, are still alive, which is pretty gruesome. Um, these parasitic wasps, um, that's actually a um, butterfly larva, but same sort of principle. Um, so sometimes you'll get a single wasp will emerge from a caterpillar. Uh, sometimes you'll get dozens and dozens of little tiny ones will come out of a single caterpillar. Um, there's even a fungus that parasitizes uh, in, uh, well, larvae and pupae. In this case, a pupae is it's called the scarlet caterpillar club. Um, so when the larvae pupate just below the surface of the soil over uh, in the autumn, over winter, you can get this uh, this fungus growing out, which obviously kills the uh, the pupa. Uh, another thing that's actually very important about moths, because of their abundance, they are actually really important nutrient recyclers. And this is probably something that's that's not really thought of. Um, this year, there have been a number of reports of oak trees being completely defoliated by caterpillars. Uh, this used to be something that's a bit more common, um, but it might have been this year because of that horrible cold May we had. A number of species that might have fed in, uh, um, over a more spread out time period this year all came out together um, and will, they will completely strip the leaves. I've seen it at one site um, where they were uh, stripping birch um, and three years running, you'd go there in mid-June, there wasn't a single leaf on the birch trees um and you'd find dozens of caterpillars crawling up anything fence posts anything trying to find more food because they they'd eaten everything that was available to them um pollination's a, a big issue at the moment um and uh, obviously moths are important pollinators they don't get seen a lot of the time um, I suppose one of the few exceptions would be like this hummingbird hawk moth, which um, gets seen at flowers during the day. But uh, obviously they're, they're doing a lot of pollination at night. There's some burnets that again might be seen during the day feeding on the flowers. But um, there's a number of orchid species which are pollinated by nocturnal moths, particularly hawk moths, that tend to have this very long proboscis. Um, so greater, greater and lesser butterfly orchids are both pollinated by hawk moths. Um, and this is an antler moth uh, on ragwort. And if you go round at night with a torch, any nectar source that is good for butterflies during the day will almost certainly be attracting moths at night. Uh, it's just something we just don't see because we're we're not looking. But um, things like ragwort, vipers, bugloss, they love knapweeds, things like that. Um, if you go around with a torch just after dusk, you will often find lots of, of moths feeding on those plants. <sighs> Are they good indicator species? When I was doing my master's, I actually had to write an essay on, on what were good indicator groups. And my conclusion was none of them. Um, so the proponents of, of any particular taxa will claim they're really important ecological indicators. Um, and then the proponents of another group will poo-poo the first group's claims. Um, I think in some ways moths are good indicators because they occupy a lot of ecological niches, they have a, a vast range of food plants. Uh, so I would say they're much better indicators than butterflies, where because there's so few species, they're um, not really representative of a, of a wide range of things. 
However, you certainly couldn't claim that moths were good indicators for dead wood beetles or sand nesting wasps or things like that. Um, so, yeah, I think really if you want to understand the ecology of a site, you need to look at across all taxonomic groups, um, which uh, is not easy to do, but um, it's certainly something that I think reserve managers should be encouraging. I used to be a reserve manager um, and if I could find an expert in snails or in beetles or in lichens or whatever, I would try and get them to come and do some recording on my site. Sometimes I had to pay them. A lot of the time these people are dead keen to come out and just would like access to nice sites and if you sort of say yeah please come and record on my reserve um they will leap at the chance okay larval feeding so um i guess this is most people's image of moth caterpillars a little green caterpillar chomping on a leaf um sometimes they're not quite so unobtrusive uh, this is a lobster moth caterpillar, um, which has this amazing markings on the head and then uh, these two tails, which those red bits are normally withdrawn in. But if you annoy it, um, it will send out these red bits and wave them around at you and try and scare you off. Um, so yeah some of them can be quite spectacular but again that's a species that conventionally just chomps away on leaves sometimes you find larvae living in communal webs um, this is what the infamous obsessionary does um, there's also a species called brown tail which is a, a brown tail moth which is a, a, a native species um, which also has irritating hairs, perhaps not quite as irritating as uh, as the obsessionary. And certainly I've picked up brown tails and, and, and handled them and I, I'm not affected. Um, but certainly in the south, you find that local councils spend a lot of time spraying these nests on bramble bushes, um, particularly near the coast. But it's a species that's spreading more inland now. Um, so yeah it does cause a bit of concern when people see these nests but not all the species that are communal feeders in these webs are the species with the irritating caterpillars so there's a group of micro moths called the ermines um and uh, yeah if you google something like um spindle ermine webs you can see sometimes you get these amazing infestations where they'll not just cover the whole bush with their webs they'll cover adjacent cars fence uh, lamp posts pavements everything uh, it's really quite spectacular um obviously it freaks people out a bit but they're completely harmless uh some species feed inside stems so um the webs it's obviously a good way of protecting yourself from predators if you're tucked away in a web during the daytime this is an alternative way of protecting yourself from predators if you feed internally in something then you're far less accessible to most of the things that want to eat you some really take it to extreme this is goat moth caterpillar and that feeds in solid wood um, so these are the emergence holes where the caterpillars come out. Um, that's a, a big old oak tree in, uh, in the new forest, but they feed in a, in a range of trees, quite often in quite young birch. Um, and so if, for instance, you're clearing birch on, a, on heathlands, um, it's something you do need to think about and you know, are there lots of these holes around the base of the birch tree that you're just about to chop down. Hmm, maybe you should leave that one. Um, it's called a goat moth because it actually has a sort of goaty smell. Um, so if you've got a good sense of smell, you can sniff and you might be able to tell whether whether you've got a goat moth uh, colony in a, in a tree if you sniff the holes. Um, 
some things go even weirder. So here's a, a larva that's feeding inside an acorn. Um, they also feed in things like hawthorn berries. Um, and even in pine cones, these are the emergence holes where the, the moth has, has come out from, uh, from it living inside a pine cone. Um, and you can actually identify the species quite often from, from these signs like the emergence holes. Uh, so some species that feed on leaves will um, use silk to wrap themselves up to give themselves protection from predators. Um, and again, if you know the species of plant and you look at the type of spinning that they've done, the way they've spun the leaf up, um, that often can be a, a good way to identify the species. Some are so small, they actually live internally in the leaf and they make these characteristic, characteristic mines, as they're called. So they're actually feeding between the upper and lower epidermis of the leaf. Um, and the pattern that you can see, the black pattern, that's called frass, that's basically caterpillar poo. Um, and again, if you know the species, the plant, and you look at the shape of the mine, sometimes the way in which that frass is, is laid down, you can identify the species. Um, and often with these really tiny ones, it's much, much easier to identify them in this way than to actually try and identify the adult moth. Um, this is another one. Um, I, if you go and look at virtually any patch of bramble, you will find this species, Stigmella aurella. Um, the mines go silvery when they're old um, and you can see them right through the winter, um, virtually anywhere you look. Some species actually mine the bark. So this is uh, a young oak and you can see this, a similar sort of wiggly line effect. And that's uh, a species that's actually mining within the live bark. Uh, unfortunately, there's now been found to be two species that do that in Britain. So all the records that everyone's ever made of these larval mines uh, are now uh, had to be aggregated. Um, and there's very, very few records of either species. So we don't know whether one's commoner th than the other or not. Um, some species make themselves a little case in, in which the, the caterpillar lives um, and they'll feed from in there again. <coughs> excuse me. Um, it gives them protection from predators. So this is an example where they've made their case out of bits of leaf that they've cut off and then uh, sewn together with silk. Um, some make their cases purely from silk, uh, like this one. Uh, and this is a one, this one's about an inch and a half long and all those different bits uh, are bits of dead heather that they've snipped off and stuck onto their case with silk uh, as the, the larva grows. They extend the case by sticking on more and more bits of, of dead heather. Uh, and this one, this is Psychicaster, um, that uses bits of dead grass. Um, and you often see that in sort of weird places when they're fixed for uh, the moth to pupate. You find them on things like wheelie bins and fence posts and road signs and things like that. So again, that's a really common species that you will undoubtedly come across. Um, this species, this, this was thought to be an endemic uh, in the UK, uh, Eudarsia Richardson. It's actually in the clothes moth family. Um, and it was one of the species that was put on the UK Biodiversity Action Plan. And when things are put on, on the BAP, they had to be given an English name. And an organization which will remain nameless wanted to call this the Dorset clothes moth. Um, which my boss had absolute kittens over. Um, so it was ended up being given the name Richardson's case bearer. But this, uh, the, the case here is again made of, of little fragments of lichen stuck together with silk. 
uh, and this feeds on the underside of Scree on uh, two sites in, in Dorset, Portland and a site further to the uh, to the east. It's now been found, it's not a UK endemic, it's been found in Portugal and I think somewhere like Hungary, um, but seems to be very, very rare across Europe. Um, but really quite bizarre that this thing can make a living by grazing the algae on the underside of scree rocks. Um, but it does and it, it survives. Um, some species are actually carnivorous. Um, this is the infamous Dunbar moth and its caterpillar. Uh, if you go collecting caterpillars um, and you want to take them home to breed them through, don't ever put a Dunbar in with anything else because by the time you get home, all you'll have is a Dunbar. Um, they, will, they will chomp through anything else that they come across. Uh, there is the infamous uh, clothes moth. Um, it's in a family called the tineids, um, and naturally they will feed in things like this, in owl pellets or, or in bird's nests. So I'm, as well as doing my moth work, I'm a bird ringer. Um, I do a lot of nest finding. Um, and when the nests are finished with, I often will bring them home and see what I can breed through. Um, and there's a chap actually did his uh, degree dissertation on it using nests from from nest boxes and he had literally thousands of nests in his garden shed over winter uh, to see what what tenants he could breed out of them the following year. Um, this is a thing that's been very little looked at, um, things that live in, you know, insects that live in birds nests and things. And I think sure there's all sorts of fascinating things to find out. There is um, there's a species that's currently thought to be extinct in Britain um which was also thought to be extinct in belgium until they found that the larvae fed in barn owl pellets and then they started collecting the barn owl pellets and seeing where it occurred and they found it's sort of still all over belgium uh, i have tried in the uk um, and all i ended up with was um the infamous um clothes moth that does eat clothes uh, which is a bit disappointing, but who knows, um, that species might still be out there living in, in barn owl boxes somewhere. Uh, this is uh, the larvae of the bee moth, um, and it lives in beehives amongst other things. Uh, in the wild, it will live in things like bumblebee nests. It doesn't actually harm the brood, this species, um, it's basically feeding in general detritus and gunk in within the, the nest. Um, and has also been found, I've, I was contacted once by Environmental Health who got called to um, someone's house and they found thousands and thousands of these larvae and they were feeding on a buildup of fibres and general detritus in the outflow from a washing machine um, and it formed this sort of big blockage of fibre and these things were, were feeding on that. Um, you get species that feed in fungi, particularly bracket fungi. There are even a small number of species that have aquatic larvae that actually, that actually feed on pond weeds and live underwater the whole time. Um, so really, uh, they feed on just about everything you can think of apart from hummus because that's inedible to all organisms. Okay, the adult stage. Um, this is a lovely crimson speckled. Uh, I think I most like to see in Britain. Uh, I've seen it in Africa. It's a rare migrant here, but um, yeah, it's a nice pretty picture anyway. Um, so, as I've previously referred, there, there are some species that fly during the day, the burnets, uh, you tend to see, uh, they're very noticeable. Um, but there are also a, a large number of other species that will feed during the day, um, or fly during the day. 
So things like the burnets, obviously they feed on flowers. This little species here though, this is a tiny species that's about three millimeter wingspan. Um, Microptrix tumbergella. The, the family that it's in, there's five or six species um, and they're the most primitive of all the moths and they still have functional mandibles and they actually eat pollen. Um, so they're the only moths that uh, that do that. Um, you can find other species of Microptrix in the, in the early spring when the buttercups first open you can see dozens and dozens of these in a, in a single buttercup head all chomping away on the pollen. Um, some species have wingless females. Uh, this is an example, spring usher. Um, that's, uh, another example which just doesn't look anything like a moth at all um, and they most of these species but not all of them tend to fly in the winter so it makes sense for the female if she doesn't have to fly around she doesn't have to waste that energy um, she can put more energy into making more eggs and let the males come to her um, so that's that's a primary reason for it. Uh, you might think, well, how on earth do they disperse? It's actually been found that the larvae uh, of some of these species and, and sorry, no, the eggs of these species, if the female gets eaten, the eggs will pass through the gut of, say, a robin unharmed and then get pooed out the other end and the robin's obviously flown off from where it found the female. So um, that's how they get dispersed around. It's quite amazing that the eggs will pass through the digestive tract without being harmed. Um, so I referred to a species that uh, had or a few species which have aquatic larvae. This one here, the water veneer, that has an aquatic adult female as well. This is the male that's got wings, the female uh, has very much reduced wings and she lives below the surface of the water and the male will, will mate with her through the uh, surface of the water. Okay, so uh, camouflage. Um, that's obviously how a lot of moths survive, not uh, trying not to be noticed. Um, some like this buff tip, it's fairly obvious what he's trying to pretend to be. Um, and uh, this scarce mauvais de jour is obviously trying to pretend that it's, uh, it's lichens on a, on a tree trunk. A uh, Chinese character that's looking like bird poo. Um, sometimes, uh, like this pink barred sallow, if you see the moth in, in isolation in a moth trap, you think, well, what on earth, how on earth is that? supposed to be disguised in any way and then you see where it's actually chosen to rest during the day and something oh right yeah actually that does camouflage really well in its its chosen environment not all rely on camouflage so uh this eyed hawk moth when it's at rest those big eyes on the hind wing will be hidden by the forewings um, but if it's disturbed it will flash those four wings forward and expose these big eyes and hopefully scare the predator away. The reason it does that, the larger moths, these ones with the, the fat bodies, um, they're unable to immediately take flight um, if a predator attacks them. Um, they need to warm up their wing mus muscles and, and you'll see this if you run a moth trap uh, in the morning the fat bodied ones, they will often have to sit there and they'll vibrate their wings uh, to warm up the flight muscles. And something as big as a hawk moth might have to do that for quite some time before it can get going. Um, I once trapped overnight in North Wales and I got very little sleep and I went through the moth trap in the morning and thought, oh yeah, pine hawk moth carried on going through the trap, finished off, packed everything up, went back to my car, sat down in my car and thought, pine hawk moth doesn't occur in North Wales. Went running back out there in a panic, 
and luckily this thing was still there trying to warm its wings up uh, it was a convolvulus hawk moth which is a, a, a rare migrant um so yeah uh, they can quite often take a long time to warm up so they need some other defense strategy this is a fairly spectacular defense strategy this is the hornet moth which uh is trying to make itself look like a hornet um and fairly convincingly so um i think um, most things would be fooled by that in its initial glance uh, others display warning colorations this is ruby tiger um with sort of characteristic red and black warning coloration on the hind wings there interestingly there's been uh analysis done of these moths and they do contain a number of toxins but every year i see these being caught uh, in flight by stone chats and fed to the stone chat chicks um, and the chicks all develop quite normally and fledge quite happily so clearly not everything is affected by the toxins that are in these moths oh, uh, there's a token bird uh, <laughs> um, right um, okay so we talked a little bit about day flying moths there are books that cover just the day flying moths um, the trouble is defining what a day flying moth is with a few species which only fly during the day that's pretty simple there is an awful lot of other species that will fly during the day and during the night um, or they're easily disturbed during the day but not seen they probably don't naturally fly during the day um, so choosing what to put in a book like that is pretty tricky and uh, there's a couple of different books with similar titles and most moth people would disagree with the species choices in at least some some cases so um it's i would tend to caution against buying books like that um i think you're probably better off buying a book that covers all the moths um and you'll find the day flying ones in there whereas i can pretty much guarantee if you just buy day flying moths book you will quite rapidly come across species that aren't in it. Uh, this is a silver wire, it's a, um, a well-known migrant um, and that classically does fly both by day and by night. Um, and it's, it's been subject to some really interesting work by Roth Hampstead Research. It's a government research centre in Hertfordshire. Um, and they've used radar to track moths flying at night, um, which is fairly amazing in itself. What's even more amazing is that by looking at the radar signals that they're getting back and by equating it to moth invasions in large numbers that are reported by the moth trappers, there are now some species they can actually identify two species from their radar signal a silver wire being one of them um which is pretty astonishing stuff i think um okay so how do moths attract a mate well in most cases the female will give off a pheromone uh, a chemical attractant which the male will pick up on and then fly in home in on the female uh, to mate um, so us clever humans have, uh, have pinched this idea um, and have actually produced artificial pheromones to attract species that are otherwise really hard to record particularly in, initially it was done for a small number of pest species where they actually uh, use these pheromone lures in traps in things like orchards um, but also for the clear wings which um, historically well, I think prior to 
the invention of pheromones, I had seen one clearing ever, not one species, just one clearing. Um, on my first afternoon out with the lures, I recorded three species. Um, so it's made uh, recording of these species much, much easier. There's now a wider range becoming available. There's a girl who did her PhD at Canterbury um, and part of what she did was in collaboration with us, she tried to develop lures for rare species that we're interested in, but which are tricky to record through conventional means. Um, quite amazing what she did. Um, so they would collect um, a, fe a couple of females. Uh, they would extract the pheromone from them and then break it down into its component chemicals and then stick those in a wind tunnel and blow each component across a male and they had electrodes attached to the antennas of the male and when the male reacted to something there was an electrical signal and that's how they told which components of this overall pheromone that was being given out were the things that were attracting the male. So with some of the lures that she developed, it worked really well. Uh, with some, it worked less well. And there was actually one species where the particular chemical was so volatile that uh, it would evaporate before you could ever get to use the lure, which was a bit frustrating. Um, this is a sort of effect that you can get with pheromone lures. These are six belted clearings uh, and literally hordes of them all around the lure. Um, it doesn't always work like that. Um, I would have lost count of the number of people who've told me they've been sold a duff set of lures. They really haven't. Um, but it, it, you can't just go and put these out and expect to uh, get swarms of clearings coming in. Okay, so um, what are we doing with the information? Well, we've just recently published um, an atlas for the macro moths. Um, it's the first uh, atlas for all the macro moths there's ever been. Um, and this is where all the records coming from all the moth recorders have been feeding into this. Um, and this is leading on to a whole series of, of extra research efforts and, and, and has recently we've reviewed our conservation priorities as a result of the results that are in this. Um, so it's, it's a really important piece of work. Um, sadly now already out of date because uh, <laughs> things are changing so rapidly. So most people are they're going out and they're recording moths with with light traps. A lot, a lot of people will just run a light trap in their garden. Um, that has some value. It has less value than going out with the traps. Um, if you if you run a trap in your garden often enough and you are good enough at identification, you will accumulate a huge list for your garden. There's a friend of mine in uh, urban Portsmouth with a little pocket handkerchief of a garden. His garden list is now uh, well over a thousand species. Are there a thousand species breeding in or near John's garden? No, nothing like it. Uh, and the longer you you run a trap in your garden, the more waifs and strays you will you will record. So personally, I think. It, what's much more useful is to get out and about, go and record in nature reserves. Still loads of nature reserves with very poor species lists um, of what's been recorded. Um, and if you're doing, you know, a relatively small number of sessions, something like say once a month, um, the sorts of things that you're getting, there's very little of that is going to be waifs and strays. And most of those things are actually going to breed on the site. Um, so it tells you a lot more useful information. Um, 
also going out and doing moth trapping sessions can, it can be a good social thing um there's a lot of a lot of moth groups now where you can go out and learn from people with more experience um and yeah it can be good fun um there are some species we know nothing about and this is the epitome of it really um this is a species that's on the verge of extinction in the UK. Um, we don't know what the caterpillars feed on. Uh, I got some eggs from a female a few years ago and distributed them around various people and said, just try and breed these through. Just you know, choose whatever you want to try and feed them on and see what happens. Um, I was fairly convinced that I'd found the answer. Um, I got them feeding on hawthorn leaves. Um, and then another person said, oh no, no, I got them feeding on um, flowers of the yellow compositae. And somebody else said, oh no, I got it feeding on knotgrass. And there's even one person uh, who fed it on diced carrot. So, were none really the wiser we did go and do a fingertip search um for larvae uh, that's get that's sorry that uh give you an idea of the the level of decline that there has been um yellow being the oldest dots blue being the middle age uh dots and the black ones being where it's been recorded since 2000 and actually in the last it's now five years since anyone's found it. I don't think it's extinct yet, um, but it's not far off. Um, so we did our fingertip search uh, for larvae, uh, a site where at the time the moth was quite common and um, it was quite limited habitat. So we sort of felt this was really the place to do it. Uh, and we did it after dark because the larvae that we had in captivity were, um, seemed to show an aversion to light so if you walked in a room to turn the light on the larvae would fall off the food plant and go and hide in the tissue paper underneath so it, we suspect it's probably a nocturnal larva um, and we did this um, for several hours and found absolutely nothing um, so <sighs> really we're sort of left with if, if someone says oh yes well we've got power shining brown recorded on our reserve what what can we do to conserve it the answer is absolutely no idea um all we can say is that there seems to be an association with calcareous soils which uh doesn't really help a, a reserve warden very much so this is a sort of uh issues that we have with moths and you know if you're familiar with butterflies where largely speaking everything's understood about what they need um we're really not in that position with in a lot of cases with the moths um so this is a, a very rare species it's the only one that has um european protection that occurs in britain the fisher's estuary moth that feeds on a, a rare plant called hog's fennel, which occurs on the Essex and Kent coasts. Species like that are actually very easy to conserve. Um, and in fact, there is a lady, Zoe uh, Ringwood, who uh, her PhD was studying Fisher's estuarine moth and she's gone on to work for uh, Natural England and now Essex Wildlife Trust. And she continues to uh, do amazing stuff for fishers estuarine moths. She single-handedly sort of done uh, save fishers estuarine moth. There's concern because um, where it occurs, literally right on on the edge of the coast, um, with uh, coastal erosion that's taking place and um, you know sea level rise, uh, it was felt that they're threatened. Um, there's one particular site, Skipper Island, um, which is an Essex Wildlife Trust reserve, which it thought will probably disappear in about 20 years because it's just slowly getting uh, eroded in by the, the sea. Um, 
So Zoe basically went round and chatted up a lot of local farmers who were a little bit further in from the coast and said, uh, that rough corner of that field over there, could I go and plant some hogs fennel in it? And in so many cases, they said yes. Um, so yeah, she's done a brilliant job of um, spreading the fish's estuary moth away from the immediate uh, threat of, uh, of the coastal erosion. There are other rare species. This is uh, this is bright wave, um, which uh, as a resident is confined to a small number of sites on the East Kent coast, uh, and one site uh, just a little bit inland in Kent. The other dots on the map are probably uh, migrant examples that have uh, come across. It used to occur on the Suffolk coast, but that colony is thought to be quite long extinct. Um, it occurs on a range of habitat, vegetated shingle, sand dunes, um, a disused hover port, uh, a coal slag heap, etc, etc. The one thing that they've all got in common is they all have quite hot microclimates. Um, and abroad, that species is found in a range of habitats from reed beds to orchards. Um, it's probable that in Britain it's limited totally by climate and there's really not a lot we can do for a species like that. Uh, with the climate change that's occurring it will probably spread of its own accord. Um, but um, yeah, it's not a species that is easy to conserve, really, other than just protecting the existing sites that it occurs on. Species that uh, feed on common plants can actually be a lot harder to conserve. So this is Kentish Glory, which is a rare species, uh, un, uh, contrary to its name. It doesn't live in Kent, it lives in the Highlands of Scotland. I believe there is a, a proposal to reintroduce it to the wire forest, um, which I must admit I'm a little sceptical of because I'm not convinced that there is sufficient habitat uh, and sufficient habitat continuity to enable it to survive. Feeding on birch trees, um, you might think, well, birch trees are everywhere. Why on earth is something like that rare? This only seems to tolerate birch trees up until they're about two metres high. Um, and you will quite often, you know, if you have something like a conifer plantation, which is clear felled and you'll get this flush of birch come in. So for a few years, it's ideal habitat for Kentish glory. Then that birch matures um and suddenly you've got no habitat and I, I fear this this could be the issue with any introduction into a wild forest um you need to ensure that you've got this constant supply of of young bushes um, that's the sort of habitat which it occupies in scotland um where you've got vast areas um of moorland which uh you know, if they can move around these areas, they will find the young birch that they need. Uh, this is dark crimson underwing. Uh, this is at the opposite end of the spectrum. This feeds on oak trees. Again, you might think, well, why on earth is, uh, is that rare? Uh, that's because until very, very recently, that fed on oak trees like that and only oak trees like that. So it was confined entirely to the new forest on these huge old ancient oak trees. That seems to be changing. Um, so this is a distribution map in, from the Atlas. Um, and you can see there are scattered dots from elsewhere and those are migratory individuals that have tipped up. About 10 years ago, we started to see indications that it was spreading out from the new forest and, and turning some of these dots just to the north of the new forest uh, are fairly conventional oak woodlands um, 
so this is quite interesting. Over the last probably five, six years, we've had a number of big uh, immigrations of these from the continent. And it now seems to be breeding. This map is now hopelessly out of date, even though it's records up to 2017. Um, uh, it now seems to be breeding over quite a wide swathe of Southern England. Um, so it really has changed. It, it's whether it's the warming of the temperatures have enabled it to move out from this ecological niche that it was stuck in in Britain of, of requiring these really ancient old trees. That could well be the answer, but very hard to know because it's very hard to know why they were confined to these very uh, old trees uh, in the first place. It's another species that's uh, done a similar thing, but is a, a little more advanced down the road, if you like. This is Olive Crescent, um, not the most startlingly beautiful of species. Um, that's the distribution map from the Atlas. Um, you'll see a series of dots in the, in the Chilterns there where it had gone and it was sort of 20 years ago confined to a single RSPB reserve on the Essex coast. Um, and we put a lot of time into researching its ecology there and trying to understand what it needed. And then again, you get uh, occasional migrants come across from the continent and some of them established themselves in Kent and since then it has spread right the way across from Kent to Dorset and it and it's breeding right the way across now. Uh, it's an interesting thing the larvae feed on dead leaves um, and the the leaves that are so dead and so crumbly that when you try and unravel them in your fingers they just crumble apart. If there's any suppleness to the dead leaf, that's far too rich a diet for the olive crescent. Um, that's again fairly astonishing that anything can can gain a living from such a, a grotty substrate, but uh, but they do, uh, and they are doing really well now. So um, we, well, I claim responsibility for you know it's all down to me that this thing is is doing so well, uh, which is obviously utter nonsense, but I won't stop me claiming it. Um, so there are uh, species that feed on things, the plants that are fairly common. Um, so this shoulder stripe clover, uh, the larvae feed on cross-leaved heath, which is the heather you find in, in damper conditions on heathland. That's a fairly widespread plant. Um, so again, quite hard to understand why it's so rare. Um, that's cross-leaved heath in flower, um, and um, it's largely confined to the New Forest now. There might still be a site in Dorset and possibly still a site in Cornwall. Um, but you think, well, you know, it's cross-leaved heath all over the place. What's the problem? What we found is that it will only utilize cross-leaved heath that is between three and seven years old since a burn. There are very few places where the heathland is managed, or well, certainly lowland heathland is managed by burning. It's fairly frequent in the grouse moors, etc. But um, this thing has always been a southern thing. It can't cope with the climate up on the, the moors. Uh, and in southern England, uh, heathens just aren't managed by burning. The one exception to this is the New Forest, where there's still regular burns take place um, to provide the young growth for the for the commoners' livestock. Um, so that seems to be what its problem is and why it's confined to um, to largely to the New Forest now. Um, so we've talked about uh, Alvi Parpella a little bit, I've covered this earlier really, but that's the distribution map for Petty Wynn and you might sort of think to yourself, well, it's all over the place. Um, but as I say, when you start to look in, in depth, most of these populations of the food plant are really quite small now. And for an invertebrate to survive, you tend to need 
quite a decent population of a food plant. Um, this is a species that I do a lot of work on, Coleophora vivicella. Um, that feeds on Dyer's greenweed, it's a similar sort of plant to Petty Wynn. Uh, and similarly, being a, a plant of unimproved meadows, it has declined quite drastically. Um, the moth is now confined to single sites in West Sussex and the Isle of Wight and two sites in Hampshire. Um, we found that it's a little bit fussy. You need some sort of disturbance um, in order for the food plant to germinate and survive. So grazing or cutting. This species is intolerant of, of cutting, even if it's done during the winter, uh, and seems to be equally intolerant of heavy grazing. Uh, I monitor the number of larvae each year at a site, and when it was overgrazed one year, the number of larvae crashed from 900 and something down to eight. Um, so it's a thing that basically needs light grazing um what we have found at one of the sites is that the graze the grazing intensity that is in the government's agri-environment scheme for overwintering wildfowl and waders the intensity that they specify for that suits this moth so one of the things we're looking to do now is to say okay well if we look at nature reserves which are already managed for overwintering wildfowl and waders, and then maybe go and plant some Dyer's greenweed around the edge. It only needs to be a strip along the fence line or along the road or that sort of thing. Um, and that will then provide the conditions that the moth requires without requiring specialized management, because let's be honest, a rather obscure little micro moth uh, you're going to struggle to persuade landowners that they should manage purely for that species. So I think we need to try and find ways to fit that species in to existing management regimes which suit it. Um, this is a whole range of species, uh, rare species that we work on that have um, fairly common food plants and we don't understand enough about the ecology. Uh, this is a problem that we have really across the board. Um, and that's really where we need the most focus of attention in the future uh, is trying to understand why these things are rare or in some cases declining. Um, we have varying levels of knowledge something like the four spotted in the top right that feeds on field bindweed and we know that it requires field bindweed growing in very sparse vegetation it needs a really hot microclimate so things just like the edges of arable fields tend to suit it um, something like argent and sable in the bottom left um, in britain it seems to like uh, scrubby birch and bog myrtle which are fairly disparate food plants um, in scandinavia it's a boom and bust species it will have these huge population booms and then just crash again and when it's having the booms apparently the larvae will feed on all sorts of things including rhododendron so it's clearly capable of surviving on a whole range of things why doesn't it do that all the time? Who knows? Um, one of the important things that we're trying to do and we're trying to encourage more people to get involved in is the monitoring of these rare species. There's basically two of us who work on moths in, in BC. We cannot, we've got a hundred, over a hundred species that were in the UK BAP, which are now have a, a they're classed as section 41 moths of 
uh, species principal importance for conservation or some such nonsense uh, in the in the current bureaucratic setup. Um, but we can't possibly look, uh, look at these all ourselves. <clears throat> so we're trying to encourage people to to do the monitoring for us. Um, most of these species don't actually need to be monitored at night. This is dark border beauty, um, which can be found easily during the day. Um, it's a species that's in, in England feeds on uh, willows, uh, specifically creeping willow, and in Scotland feeds on aspen, which is rather odd. Um, but it's now confined to one site in England um, and the population there has crashed as a result of the introduction of grazing. Um, so we're now having to negotiate with the landowners about reducing the grazing intensity so that this moth can survive there. Um, that is the rather unattractive larva. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yes, that's the rather unattractive larva of, of uh, netted carpet. Um, so that's confined now in Britain to the Lake District. Um, it feeds on a fairly scarce plant called Touch Me Not, not Touch Me Not Balsam, um, and um, we go and get uh, people to count the larvae of that at uh, all its sites. It's actually doing really well now because it's Touch Me Not Balsam likes disturbance, and we've managed to get cattle grazing. Uh, light cattle grazing introduced into a number of the woodlands where it, it occurs. They poach the ground a little bit, touch me not balsam comes up and the moth is, is responding really well. Uh, this is a species that I do a lot of work on. This is a fiery clearwing. Um, that lays its eggs on mainly curled dock, but occasionally on other docks and also on common sorrel. And it's a species that in Britain is uh, confined, currently confined to Kent, the Kent coast. 15, 20 years ago, it was only found literally on the seashore. You walk 10 meters in off the beach and you wouldn't find it. Um, but climate change is having it, uh, counteracting effects on this species. So, uh, what we found is that as it's getting warmer, it's enabled it to move inland. But the rate of coastal erosion that's taking place in Kent now is quite scary. Um, whole beaches that were there last, well, last year in particular, there'd obviously been a big storm event and, and several whole beaches which this thing used to occupy had been washed away totally. Um, so fortunately, it's managing to move in off, uh, off these beaches of its own accord. Um, and I suspect will start to spread because it's food plants are uh, your classic weed species of, of disturbed ground. And you find this on, on things like roundabouts and, and such like. One of the best colonies is underneath uh, a bridge that was built 10 years ago and obviously a um, massive amount of earth moving and disturbance when they built this big um, dual carriageway bridge um, and yeah the moths loving it underneath that. Um, this is a rather obscure little species Lamprania capitella that feeds on currants, currant bushes and we monitor this by looking for these wilted leaves first thing in the spring. It's actually living in the tip of the shoot and boring down into the stem. And where it does that, it causes the leaves to wilt. Um, so we, yeah, we monitor that by, by going around counting wilted leaves. Right, why study them? Well, they're a very diverse group. As I say, there's over two and a half thousand species. They're easy, in inverted commas. Um, there are good quality identification guides available. There's lots of people out there now who will help beginners. Um, when I started, there were probably 20 or 30 people in the country who did moths. 
I was very lucky that I lived near one of them and he was immensely helpful um, and I probably would have given up if I hadn't had his help. Um, but nowadays you will not live far from somebody who can help beginners and of course there is now social media where there are loads of Facebook groups, um, there's uh, um, guys on Twitter who do loads of identification for stuff so, uh, for people so um, yeah relatively easy for you to post your photographs and get people to uh, tell you whether you've got it right or wrong which is is really important when you're starting out um, it's also easy in as much as you don't actually need to leave home, um, despite what I said earlier um, about it being more useful to get out and about and survey natural habitats. Um, you don't have to, and certainly when you're starting out, um, you know, running a trap in your garden uh, is is a great way to get going and you know uh, build your skills. There are still loads of opportunities to make exciting discoveries. Um, so I've mentioned some a lot of the species that you know where we just don't understand the ecology yet, um, and that applies across the board. You know, it, it applies just as much to the common species as it does to the rare ones. So um, yeah, this you know it might you might have to do five years of hard research to find out something really exciting about a bird but um, you can do it on a moth in an afternoon um, and consequently you can make a name for yourself um, which if you're looking to develop a career in conservation um, is a really useful thing to do uh, you can publish your findings in journals like these and you might be thinking oh my god that's scary I can't write scientific papers and I can't do statistics and all this sort of stuff you don't need to you might need to if you're writing a paper on birds or even on plants you know heavy duty science with meaningless stats that only three people in the world can understand not in entomology it's still very much descriptive it's um it's like it's natural history still so all these journals will publish papers where you just say you know i went out this is what i saw this is what i found this is what i observed um and i mean certainly you know something like the entomologist record you submit a, uh, an article to that it will be published within two three months so uh you get some instant uh, gratification for what you what you found um so yeah you know that can be really useful if you're applying for a job and you're saying you know well yeah i've i've, you know, I've published five papers and in, on insects and things that i found um and observations that i've made uh you know, it stands you out from the crowd um mention a little bit about entomological careers there are a few more than there used to be but there's still very few jobs available on anything to do with insects um it's really the same sort of principle as getting any job in conservation um but just a little more extreme so it's making yourself noticed is standing out from the crowd you know there are thousands and thousands of graduates churned out each year with vaguely relevant degrees um and most of them will never get a job in conservation um the ones who do or the ones who are virtually guaranteed to are the ones who get involved in stuff beyond what they've learnt uh in their in their classroom or reading in books they actually get out and they do things themselves and you don't need to spend yeah you know, I hear it said a lot oh you know I can't, I can't afford to go volunteering five days a week blah blah you don't need to um you can do little things you know in your spare time that will make you stand out you know, things like oh yeah you know, I have written 
a few articles for a magazine or for or for an entomological journal. Um, you know, I helped out with surveying at this site and that site of this species and that and that species. Um, you know, I'm volunteering by doing monitoring of such and such a moth, which might need one, two visits for say an hour to go and walk a transect, that sort of thing. So there are lots of ways you can actually make yourself stand out. And certainly if you're if you're set on an entomological career, getting your name known will be immensely helpful to you because there are so few jobs that when they do come up, um, you know, you you really need to make the most of that opportunity. And if they see your your name and oh I've heard of that person I've heard of that oh yes they they wrote this paper on such and such or they do this or they do that 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 will make a lot of difference um, it's all supposed to be objective when people do shortlisting but believe me it isn't um, anyway so that's really me sort of finished um, it's my email address there if people want any help or advice about anything to do with moths um you know feel free to get in touch um the reply that you get at this time of year might be a bit slow but i i do try and get back to you fairly quickly if i can and i'm happy to take any questions i had a question <laughs> um so out of the like 2500 or so species that are in the uk um like how many of them are endemic um i'm, 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 I'm trying to think whether we've got any endemic moths oh, okay. uh they used to be as i say eudastin richardson i used to be thought to be endemic that's now been found on the continent there are there are a number of supposedly endemic subspecies mm -hmm. um which frankly most of us don't really believe uh these in these subspecies you tend to, to get color forms of things and in in britain having a slightly colder climate we tend to get darker looking things than than the same species on the continent to then turn around and claim that's a subspecies is a bit tenuous. <laughs> um, there are one or two other things like um, there's a species called small and grailed, which uh, if it's a real species, that would be endemic. Um, the problem is the Europeans don't believe it's a real species. <laughs> They think it's a single brooded form of another species called the engrailed. Um, no doubt these things will be resolved by DNA in due course. But um, yeah, we're still at, at sort of in the early stages of using DNA with moths. And I think uh, there's a lot of change that's going to occur. There are various things that have happened in the last 10 years where what we thought was one species has suddenly become several and that sort of thing so yeah there's a long way to go before we use dna widely um but yeah i don't think uh, not very many if any um is, is the answer <laughs> a few in ireland actually particularly on the burren um the, the famous limestone area in ireland Yeah, we haven't been separated from the continent for for <laughs> very long. <laughs> Any other questions, guys? Feel free to put them in the chat if you want. Go for Emma. Um, yeah, with the pheromone traps, are there any issues with using those, like at specific times, different times of the year? I don't know whether they could potentially like actually interfere with sort of like the natural pheromones sort of being sent out by breeding females. Yeah. Um... It's something that is starting to cause a bit of concern. We've been contacted by a few reserve wardens who are concerned about 
multiple people going to the same reserve to try and lure the same species which isn't really adding anything other than a tick to their list because it's already known that the species occurs there um it's, it's tricky because it's it's you know how do you police it um my personal feeling the way i use pheromone lures uh is i will i will hang a lure up and i will watch it maybe 10 15 minutes at the most and if i haven't found the moth by then i will move a couple of hundred meters and i'll try again somewhere else i think where it's most likely to cause a problem is where people are using them inside these traps and they're hanging it up literally for eight ten hours at a time and i think that's an issue it seems to be only being or mainly being done in people's gardens so yeah it's, it's it's all a bit pointless because if you've dragged something into your garden from two miles away you know, yeah. um but you know you can't really stop people doing it um we do keep quiet about pheromone lures for certain species uh <laughs> like we don't admit, admit that they exist um and and the main supplier in the uk is has been very good and also doesn't mention on his website that some of his lures work for certain rare species um but yeah all we can really do is educate a little bit and and try to encourage people to actually do it by visual watching of the lure rather than hanging lures up for many many hours i think that's where there would be most concern is it something that might be done maybe if it if it became kind of an ongoing problem that it was done through sort of like a license or some kind of or maybe through organized moth groups only rather than like individuals or something or i think you would struggle to prevent people from buying the lures i mean even if if we were to persuade anglian lepidopterist supplies who are the main supplier in the uk if we persuaded john to to stop by, uh, selling them um which he would probably do if we could provide evidence there was a real problem the trouble is these days you can get stuff off the internet from poland or wherever you know you wouldn't stop people getting hold of these things um so yeah i think it's more a case of trying to educate trying to get people to understand where there might be issues um and yeah at the moment they it, the use of the lures has been beneficial in as much as we've learned a lot more about the distribution of these things and also possibly which of the clear wings are actually in trouble because with this vast increase in the use of lures you'd expect the number of records of all of them to have shot up but there's three species where they've actually the number of records has gone down and that suggests there is a real problem for those three species which we're now starting to look at um, but yeah it's it's something we need to keep an eye on and we need to try and educate the moth community um and try and get them to engage responsibly the the problem i fear is that actually a large proportion of the new mothers have come from a birding background and when i say birding what i mean is switching and they've brought a similar philosophy into mothing and it is all about the tick um so yeah that makes it a little bit harder <laughs> yeah it's actually interesting you say that my mum's um part of a moth group um but she and she came to it from birding but luckily the nature reserve where she does it is actually a major sort of bird ringing site so right. she was already kind of used to the sort of regular just monitoring rather than twitching um which i think so when she's kind of, kind of moved to the moth side that principle was already embedded for her rather than just trying to tick off the exciting ones yeah i think i think uh, generally speaking 
a lot of the birders that have come over to Mothing, I think there was a, a, a big fear amongst the moth community that they would try and change it very much to the twitching mentality. And I think generally it's been more that they have tended to adapt themselves to the way that we do things. But there is a minority uh, who do cause problems. We've had issues with people going onto private land, searching for rare moths without permission and things like that. And there are complete nutters. There is a guy who flew from Bristol to Belfast to twitch a moth in somebody's fridge that had been caught in Southwest Ireland. Um, you know, when you've got people with that mentality, <laughs> you know, uh, you I think you're dealing with a, a whole new species really, aren't you? <laughs> they're, they're not normal. <laughs> Yeah, you have to assume and hope they're the anomaly, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, hopefully, you know, I mean, I think we do need to to start to educate the moth community a bit more. It's, uh, it's not that easy because at the moment um, there isn't a particular source uh, uh, that you can get to these people through. Um, you know, a lot of people are still acting very independently. And, and one of the problems that we find that the county recorders are, are saying there are loads of people now mothing in their counties who never interact with the county recorder. Um, and that's something that you know, we need to try and, and educate people on as well, because, you know, if you're recording moths and not submitting the records into the county recorders, which then get into all the monitoring and schemes, etc. Um, well, what you're doing is fairly pointless, really. Um, it's just there for you to tick things off in your book. Um, but you know, it's it, it's it, it's improved uh, vastly in terms of number of people who are involved, and hopefully, you know, we can we can bring a lot more of these newer people into the fold as well and get them contributing positively brilliant thank you thank you for the talk it's really interesting okay any other questions guys uh so james has said in the chat uh you mentioned day flying moth guides aren't so useful so what field guides would you recommend instead okay um i just get back and share my screen and I'll just go back to uh, the, the right slide um, when my computer wakes up. <sighs> Come on. It's not working. Uh, let's try. Hang on. Um, if I find the right slide and then share my screen, that might work. Right. So. Um, Right, if I try and share the screen now. So those those are the two books. If I was starting off um, and didn't want to spend an absolute arm and a leg, um, these guides are now published by Bloomsbury. Um, and the, the larger moths one is Waring, Townsend and Lewington. And the smaller moths one is Sterling Parsons and Lewington. Um, there is also a version of the macro moths one, which is called the Concise Guide, um, which has all the same species in it, just far less text, uh, and is therefore a fair bit cheaper. Um, so yeah, you could start off with a Concise Guide rather than the field guide. Um, although text is really important um, 
certainly I noticed in, in my local Hampshire moth group uh, on Facebook, um, you know, people like someone yesterday thinking they've got least minor, which is only known from sort of Northumberland, County Durham and Cumbria. Um, and if they'd actually read the text in their book, they would have realised that they couldn't possibly have had least minor <laughs> in Hampshire. So, yeah, the text is valuable. But those are probably your best two starter books. Um, and you'll find a number of websites are really useful. What I would caution against is using Google image search. Um, there's so much misidentified stuff on the web. Um, if you use a reliable site, UK Moths is one. There are various county moth groups which have really good websites um, and the images on those should be correct. Um, but yeah, you can you can certainly use them. And as I say, social media now, if, you, if you're unsure, you can just take a photo. There's loads of different Facebook groups and on Twitter, um, Oh God, what do people put? Uh, hmm, forgotten what the hashtag is that people use on Twitter. <laughs> I don't I don't tend to use it myself. Uh, just not enough hours in the day. Um, but yeah, I'm sure you can find on Twitter very quickly uh, how you can get stuff ID'd. Um, as for the other social medias, though, I'm afraid way over my head. So if you if you want to know about Instagram or something, you're on your own. <laughs> um, the one other thing I would mention is that I mentioned county recorders. There is a county recorder in every county. Sometimes there's more than one. Uh, they uh, they might split the macros and the micros, or you might just have more than one person sharing the load. Um, do send the records to them, even if it's just like a few day flying things. You'd be amazed actually the day flying things tend to be under recorded these days um, because everyone's relying on moth traps so much. Um, and whichever county you're in, so, you know, obviously Warwickshire, a lot, for a lot of you, but if, you know, if you move to Caithness uh, and want to know, or go on holiday to, to if you're going on a walking holiday in Wales in the next couple of days, for instance, and you see a few moths and you want to uh, know who the county recorder is for that um, for that county, it's all on the Butterfly Conservation website. If you just Google county moth recorders, it, you'll get to it very quickly. Um, and there's all the contact details for them there. That's great. That's really useful to know, actually. I had no idea that you could get a hold of people that way. <laughs> um, is there any other questions, guys? Oh, we're good. I think we're good. Okay, so... Um, don't be depressed by the football. That, that's <laughs> what it is. <laughs> Come on, you saw the game against Scotland. You, you know it's... <laughs> you just don't want to bother tonight. <laughs> Okay, cool. Well, I think we'll call it a night there then. Um, thank you everyone for joining um, and thank you so